pet parents and welcome to another episode of Natural Pets TV. I'm joined by Heidi Nevela, Dr. Jody, and Dr. Patrick. I think one of the things that is so important but rarely discussed is digestion, digestive issues. Dr. Patrick, lead us through that. I think a lot of pet owners take digestion in their cats and dogs and other species too as pets of course for granted until something goes wrong and then when something goes wrong they're aware of it obviously and they're hopefully trying to get the condition diagnosed and appropriately resolved but that's when um, people start really focusing on it and what are the means of trying to avoid the problems that were occurring how can we um, how can we make the digestive tract function normally because it's so integral to whole body health if our digestive tract doesn't work well we're not absorbing nutrients our immune system isn't functioning op optimally we're not eliminating waste from the body and really the digestive tract starts at the mouth um, you need your mouth to take the food in. You need your teeth to chew your food. Some pets do okay without teeth, of course, too. You need your esophagus to transport the food and liquid from your mouth into your stomach. Your stomach is there to use the acid and the mechanism of grinding to help to contraction and grinding to try to break the food up. And then it passes into the small intestine. In, at that time, also, it has um, digestive enzymes put in from the pancreas. It gets worked through the small intestine where you have some nutrients that are absorbed. In the, in the large intestine or the colon, that's where you have fecal storage and formation and water absorption, and then it's eliminated out through the rectum. So um, it's all very important that everything works very well together so that you can have a good, um, optimally functioning body. And the good thing is that there's a lot of new techniques that can help to make your pet's digestive tract healthier from whole food diets to probiotics to prebiotics to other substances that help to calm down the intestinal tract when it's inflamed. So there's really so many things that we veterinarians can now offer our patients to try to make their digestive tract function better. And there are a few things that make our carnivores in particular a little different uh, from us as far as uh, what they would successfully digest and what we need to feed them. Um, one of the things you mentioned is they're, they're chewing. They really don't chew their food, for example, as we do, or a lot of the herbivores, which would mean then that they can't break down a lot of the plant fibers like we do. So uh, being a predator and eating a more meat-based diet then would be very important. Um, they also don't have the cellulase enzyme in the saliva in their mouth in order to um, break down some of those plant materials. So it's important that if they are going to eat vegetation, that they eat it in a pre-digested type of state where we either blend it and warm it for them or they eat the stomach contents of the prey. I don't think any um, discussion of digestive health would be complete if we didn't talk about the things that you potentially could do wrong um, to um, make this great system not work effectively and one of those big things is always f uh, feeding things that would cause inflammation and uh, inflammation is the bane of our existence um, when things become inflamed in the gut uh, in the small intestine in particular um, the inflammation can actually break down the cement that holds those cells together and when those cells move apart that creates leaks in the gut and so we call that leaky gut syndrome and the uh, proteins that should get uh, uncoiled by the acids in the stomach should then be presented properly in the upper part of the small intestine where the enzymes then function to break them down properly. And then those little amino acids should go through those cells properly into the bloodstream, bloodstream to the liver where they then are detoxified properly. But if there are leaks in the gut, then those proteins go through those big gaps whole instead of broken down into their little amino acids. And the liver goes, eek, I don't recognize you, uh, get out, and sometimes sends it out through the skin, for example. Um, and then you have skin disease, which is actually due to gut health problem or a liver detoxification problem. So we can actually um, help that by first of all not feeding those things that are unnatural or inflammatory to the gut and secondly we can feed some things then to help repair the gut and that's vital to um, any disorder. Uh, some of the things that I use in my practice to help heal leaky gut are of course probiotics and we can talk a lot about that um, but I have found some success with sauerkraut. Um, going back to the old days when we all ate fermented foods and when the animals were allowed to bury bones and dig them up later and, and have their own sort of natural ways of consuming things that had been fermented, uh, we've gotten away from that. 
and that fermentation uh, actually creates some great microorganisms that help heal the gut. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's good old fashioned bone broth. Um, but you need to make your bone broth correctly. You need to add that apple cider vinegar in the recipe because that's what draws the trace minerals out of the bone. And those are vitally important. Um, you can also go with a little bit more of a nutraceutical product uh, as part of your leaky gut um, recipe, and that would be L-glutamine. And uh, one thing that happens when you have chronic diarrhea is the little villi, those finger-like projections that are um, inside the line of the bowel that are responsible for helping with the absorptive process, they get stripped out of there. When that diarrhea is, you know, that water's just flowing through, it's because everything gets smooth in there and you wanna help regenerate those villi. And so L-glutamine is an amino acid that you can feed that helps with regenerating those villi. What kinds of things do you use? Get this call a lot for leaky gut, a <laughs> lot and, and it's related to so many other body systems I mean the, really the impetus for it whether it shows up uh, gets confused with an allergenic response if there's a, a skin response like alopecia or something but um, there's there's uh, several herbs but the primary that I like to start with or really suggest is Sangre de Grado simply because again there's there's really no downside or side effects to using it uh, it does have pre and probiotics, digestive enzyme, but the most impressive thing about it is, is the plant chemistry that's natural. Uh, it's a vulner or a wound healer, and it's really good at, at, at this inflamed tissue. It's an anti-inflammatory as well. It's also a pain reliever, but it's an antiviral, bacterial, fungal, anti-candidal. It does so many things. Um, it helps reset gut flora, but also in the smooth muscles that might be interrupted, it, it soothes and eases that as well. Kind of reconditions that area and primes it to you know really heal, um, especially those those perforations in in the gut. That's really you know facilitating the problem. Um, and then downstream, it also helps with the, with the elimination and those kind of issues. It gives a nice nod to um, immune support as beyond being anti-inflammatory. So that's one. There's there's you know more more you know, there's like Carqueja is another one. Maniupa is a wonderful, um, very gentle herb for all life stage two. Same kind of same kind of chemistry, but it also does more. It's a, a little bit more of a digestive um, supplement, um, and it also calms down other part other body systems that are impact, like the endocrine system, the immune system, get involved with this. So those are some that we like to make suggestions for. Of course, working in, conduct, in conjunction with the pet parents vet, make sure they're not mixing it with anything that you know may not agree. A lot of those plants, um, of course, contain chlorophyll, mm -hmm. and you can even supplement chlorophyll pearls as a healing agent. They'll heal yeah. ulcers, chlorophyll mm -hmm. helps with pain. Um, so there are a lot of nutraceuticals that, can, that we can use to help with digestive health. I've used tons of them. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I've unfortunately somehow at some point contracted parasites without even going to a third world country, <laughs> probably from eating bad sushi, but I'm not quite oh, sure. It's, it's um, really fun. And I felt like, oh my, this is what my patients are going through. <laughs> and I did take medication to help it, but also I tried, well, I tried to first just, before just jumping to taking medication and not like an anti-diarrheal medication or an acid, but an antibiotic, anti-parasitic based on what I suspected I had before I had a confirmed diagnosis. <laughs> I started with probiotics to try to make my, to try to improve the, the health of my gut. I eliminated a couple of things that were acidic and I still wasn't feeling better and my condition actually was progressing to like night sweats and joint pain and things like that. It turned out I had a parasite very similar to Giardia. I had a protozoa and I had an amoeba on top of that. And the amoeba was very opportunistic. It just kind of was there because my normal gut function wasn't working to eliminate it. So I took my medication to eliminate it and I immediately felt better. I wasn't having like the awful things that my patients go through. And then I try to restore my gut probiotic, my gut um, flora with probiotics and I, I have felt so much better since then. But I felt like I really had sympathy for what my patients go through. And I've seen them go through way worse whether it's like explosive diarrhea. And this might be a good place where we talk about like the digestive tract and what happens when there's um, problems inside. Your, your pet might not eat as well, so their appetite can be down. They could have vomiting or regurgitation. Vomiting is when you have an active contraction of the abdomen, so there's a, a forceful ejection of food. Regurgitation is very passive. It almost is like something just pours or falls out of their mouth. And then there's diarrhea. So diarrhea can be large or small bowel diarrhea. Small bowel diarrhea tends to be soft and kind of pale in color. It doesn't have any urgency for them to go. There could be some 
dark tarriness to it, which might indicate blood that's digesting as, it's, as it moves through. Then there's large bowel diarrhea, which is it, it can have one or all the above characteristics. There could, there could be urgency, there could be flatulence, there could be uh, blood, mucus, watery explosiveness to it. It's usually what is more alarming to pet owners and, and drives them to go to the emergency vet if needed. So you have all sorts of things that can go wrong with the digestive tract, and that's why I feel like we always want to try to keep digestive tract function as consistent as possible, and that's where the use of probiotics, um, and, and in my practice, I actually try to get the pet's gut working very well and then stop the probiotics and see if we can maintain that gut health. But if we need to just give a daily probiotic, I feel like that's a very safe and appropriate way of helping. Sometimes probiotics appear in food, like in raw meat diets or even some commercially available processed pet food, yet what goes into the pet food bag, uh, this is why I'm not really a huge fan of processed food like kibble, a lot of those beneficial bacteria don't survive, either the production process or the storage process. And so we have to think like if you're going to be eating dead bacteria, is it really going to do your body any good? And that's why I want to make sure it's live as it goes through the body and even actually gets through the stomach and survives the acidic environment and gets into the small intestine. And that's why I'm generally a fan of probiotics being, if we're going to give a probiotic supplement, being in capsule form so it does pass through. Mm -hmm. Some, yeah, enterocoated, somehow, somehow get yeah. it through. Some bacteria will live but not, it may not be as potent um, as a treatment as compared to if it is in some kind of format to and there get are it where it needs to go. Yeah, and there's certain <laughs> strains that will survive the stomach acid to yes. be effective. And you mentioned um, with your disorder <laughs> identifying the, Sorry um, to put all that the, out there. the parasites <laughs> and um, so to go <laughs> a little too much information, but um, checking a fecal sample um, is often important, but some people think that that's the only thing that veterinarians can check or do check as far as identifying what's wrong with the digestive disorder. Um, what I found in my practice is a GI panel um, is often so important and uh, sometimes a guardian thinks, oh, this has been tested, everything's been done, they can't figure out what's wrong, but don't forget about this GI panel. Um, what I love about it is it um, can help rule out so many things. Um, pancreatitis is another um, digestive related disorder that we always want to rule out if there's vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, um, and a CPL or an ACAD and FPL, that's uh, the words we use. Um, so when you're looking at your blood panel, so you can be your uh, pet's advocate and, and know what to look for. Um, a TLI is for pancreatic insufficiency, mm -hmm. and that's one of those digestive disorders that's very serious, but when you identify it and you put them on pharmaceutical grade enzymes, um, to treat it, soak their food in these enzymes and then feed them that way every day, oh my gosh, they blossom. It's one of the most rewarding things I think that we can treat, but you have to do the right blood panel to identify it. And then lastly in that panel is measuring cobalamin and folate, um, two B vitamins that are absorbed from the upper and lower part of the small intestine. And when you do that, it's a very, I think, non-invasive way to find out some information of what's happening right at that bowel lining level without doing it um, jumping into a more invasive testing like intestinal biopsy. So sometimes it can even give us a clue. Do they have inflammatory bowel disease? You know, might they have GI lymphoma? And then we need to go further with other tests. And there's just some very practical things pet parents can do too. Just feed the premium, you know, premium nutrition, whole food basically, or whole food, hopefully, uh, bioavailable food, filtered water, don't radically change the diet too quickly. Keep yes. food and mm -hmm. water bowls clean, like mm -hmm. fresh, every day. Um, don't let them have access to, uh, to too much to table scraps, hopefully not all, and limit garbage access. You know, those are just some real practical things that can be done to make sure that what's, whatever's going is, isn't creating problems downstream. I have, I have so many patients where um, they are their own worst enemy <laughs> because they want to eat things that they shouldn't. They have, they have episodes of dietary indiscretion, which just itself, whatever they're consuming, as, as the body's trying to acclimate to it, as it's trying to get it through, they cause so many problems, especially in puppies and kittens, mm -hmm. or even um, as sometimes pets get older and they develop certain conditions, say like Cushing's disease, where the body is pumping out too much cortisol, which is causing them to be hungrier, therefore they forage in the backyard and they eat soil that happens to have bacteria in it, um, and, or parasites or something like that, or they might be on a medication like a steroid to help to control a condition. So that's where it's always great if we can think ahead limit their access to certain environments. If you do have that pet that is prone to dietary indiscretion, work very hard to prevent them from doing so because you're gonna have to keep on calling your vet again and again or taking them to the hospital. Sometimes when there's the dietary indiscretion, it's that they actually know um, 
or think they know what they're looking for something to fill in a nutritional gap, uh, one of my uh, favorite approaches to that is sprouted seeds. Um, when you do an analysis of what's in sprouted seeds, it's just amazing the whole food vitamins, the enzymes, um, even some omega-3 fatty acids, the probiotics that all come from that. I think it kind of answers that question that we all ask, why does my dog or cat run outside and want to eat grass? Mm -hmm. um, I think innately they know that there can be a lot of nutrition in there. And if they have a, an episodic indiscretion, a gentle cleanse is a really good thing to add into, a gentle herbal cleanse to rid of maybe whether it's parasitics or parasites or bad food or whatever, whatever it is they got into. Um, there's a lot in the herbal world that can help that way too. So as you can see, there is a lot to observe, take note of, and communicate to your veterinarian and professionals that you work with for your pet's healthcare team. Thanks for joining us here on Natural Pets TV. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. It was another great episode with a lot of great information, and we really appreciate you keep the conversation going in the comment section down below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel as we have a lot of great episodes with a lot of great information coming to you with a lot of great guests. And if you want more information on our guests, for Heidi Nevola, you can get that at naturapetswithaz.com, Dr. Jody at Dr. Jody's Natural Pets.com and Dr. Patrick at PatrickMahaney.com. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon.